we just got done listening to chapter one. A couple things from my point of view. One, it's like I said, it's hard to hear myself back. Mm -hmm. Two, to Trey mentioned, is that the emotion, you don't realize like, well, this shit is like, it was like oh, this is difficult because this is mm -hmm. like the forming yeah. like years of why I hate what's going on in my life. So when you read it back, there's emotions that are drumming up from being riding my bike to a place to work to the to here you're thinking about is it gonna is it possible is it gonna work obviously i know it worked now mm -hmm. but when i hear these thoughts these were all parts of my life where i was so fed up and i wanted to change but i didn't really know if it could change when you were reading it back did it throw you back into that memory like sure. right away 100 like i mean you could kind of tell i mean we all felt it i think yeah all oh, definitely because you think like i remember feeling like embarrassed about certain situations i remember being like literally upset like mad that it was like that and then you you cannot how can you not look at other people and be like it it's a comparison this is when you're a kid you don't know any better you're like fuck why is that dude got it better than me you know it's not their fault but mm -hmm. that's an easy thing but it was really the the work ethic combined with being fed up combined with seeing another way that kind of concept together i think just helped me so much mm -hmm. so yeah we can go through each kind of bullet point i know cole said he think that's a good way to go so i'll, I'll let you yeah. kind of start it off cole um, uh, yeah can you just like like walk us through at this time because like how old were you whenever you really sort of notice you know the dad with the lottery tickets mm -hmm. you know your mom you sort of notice how tall the actual trailer is like can you break down like yep. that scene yeah so the first time I noticed that the lottery was like a major problem is before we moved to the trailer we were renting um, like a duplex behind this grocery store actually that one of the coal miners is one of Josh's uncles that he started the grocery store we were renting it and I remember my dad was on strike for some reason from the coal mine because he was trying like other jobs at the time like he had like an interior business and then he like trained guard that's why I don't like dogs by the way or I don't love dogs we'll say is because he had trained guard dogs at my house so we had like these killer dogs around all the time when i was a kid anyway so uh, <laughs> yeah that one oh yeah i got it i got it i have it i have a news article at, at the house i'll bring it in interior it's like, design and killer dogs in, yeah. uh interior like car like car uh, oh god interior. Oh, not it. interior ah. design i don't think that was <laughs> <laughs> i don't think that was the thing was yet like, daddy I was like, hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah that's a really good mix there anyway so I was like, I remember uh, I was in his downstairs, like in his bedroom or in their bedroom. And I opened up a, a drawer, like a dresser drawer. And it was full of lottery tickets. I mean, fucking full of them, bro. And I was thinking to myself, like, what the hell is this? Because I know they all cost at least a dollar. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm mm -hmm. realizing, like, I don't know, because I'm probably like, maybe like 10 years old or something. I know that, like, this ain't matching up, like. Yeah, I'm Andon's age, right? My my son Andon's ten. He would know shout if there's out. like, yeah, shout out Andon. He'd know if there's something going on. So I could, I didn't really know because I was so young, but I realized they were always arguing. It definitely sounded like we had no money, like bills were not being paid. But somehow there's this whole drawer for of fucking lottery tickets, and so I just started to really kind of put two and two together that um, financial decisions that were being made was not the proper ones at the time, and I think understanding like that, that being let down, I think that is like one of the worst things you can do for your kids is like build them up and let them down. And that was just something he did traditionally a lot. And I don't know that he did it on purpose or knew it or probably knew how it affected us, but that is like just a really bad way to feel. So I try to make sure I don't do that <laughs> with my kids as much as possible. I was going to say, so was he like painting like a vivid picture of like what it could be? If you, yeah. if you won, was he doing that regularly to you guys? Yeah, you wouldn't tell like, us like exactly the amount, but it was like one of those things like when it was like, when because this is like way before, obviously way before the internet. It's like we're huddled around the <laughs> yeah. TV. There's like four stations, mm -hmm. nine cable or anything. And it's like, and close from the Valley, you know, it's like you're sitting around and you're like pick four. And when you I- You guys are all sitting there just watching it. You got like, it. Hoping. Yeah, hoping like, oh my gosh, is that going to win today? And then it's like when you box it or do it straight, the box means, so, so if you play- seven five seven well if you get it straight there's more money if you box it it can come in any form gotcha so he'd play both ways so i'm like we just need the three numbers we win either way <laughs> but like why do i even know that you know what i mean yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like you know ingrained into you <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah oh yeah and it's uh yeah so so i just remember like locking on to that because i wasn't hearing 
hey, this is how we're going to make this situation better in a more like formal, like, oh, let's build wealth. Let's, you know, let's mm -hmm. build these. Because he did have entrepreneurial spirit because I watched him build or try to build a few, you know, side gigs that would have made him income. So it was there, but it just never got over the top. So that's yes. the best way to explain what I remember back. Um, one thing I have highlighted is a very important thing, and it's it's whenever you were super young and you got your first delt cut. Yeah, and yes. you know I think uh, all of us here, obviously lifting weights, p played a huge impact in, into our confidence in that start. But you know, sure. I remember the same way whenever I f first saw the first bicep vein. You know, yeah, that's like the start of the compound effect and like stuff like that. So can you speak more yeah, about that? I remember uh, one. I just really enjoyed that time I was spending with my grandpa because I was like I could tell something he really liked to do. And his son never really lifted weights. So it kind of then went like his dad taught him. My dad actually lifted weights, but his son didn't. So it was almost kind of like he got a chance to kind of get in there with me. And he knew I needed that father figure. So then when I started getting that consistency and I start literally saw my body change, I was like, wait a second. Like, and I, and I just made a connection on how it made me feel. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, and that's why I always talk about being addicted to feeling good. Mm -hmm. I was like, man, I want more of that. But then I think it's like a, that's like what you talk about, Cole. It's like a small win. You're like, well, yeah. if I can get that, what's really possible? I, I really think, and that's like at like 12 years old. And I think as a dad now, like you know, that's only a few years you know older than Andon and a little bit younger than Madeline. It's like, gosh, like that was a pretty intuitive thing. I think that kind of yeah. I I came upon like thinking like, oh, okay, this is how we put it together. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, that was a cool feeling. That's like that that experience of seeing the first Dell cutter first vein is you know. You put in all this work and yes. this, this it's the first little taste of like, oh, what I'm doing is working. Like, like the, the, yeah. there you go. And it was tied to that we were consistent. See, because that's the one thing about my grandpa. He's a very consistent guy. So he come home from work at the same time. We're in the basement at the same time. We actually did about the same workout every day too. He really didn't know that part. But <laughs> the reality is though, but it was, all, I knew that I didn't have to ask him if we were lifting or not. That's probably where it comes from, guys. Why I'm so like defined and definite about, are you going to be at the gym? Yeah. That, that's how I learned. Yeah. I didn't know. And he didn't say, oh, you know what? I, you know, build an extra house today. I, I can't train. It was like that. He enjoyed spending that time with me. He knew I needed that positive reinforcement. And he just was definitively there. It's like a non-negotiable. It was a non-negotiable. At least that's how I remember it. Yeah. Yeah. And so that to me was, I think, set a really, you know, great standard for me early. So for sure. Cool. Um, one thing too, just like from conversations and then obviously in the book too, is like painting the actual picture of like your trailer. Mm -hmm. Right. And then can you also talk about like, I guess transitioning into the trailer and then when your parents split, can mm -hmm. you like talk a little bit about that yeah. and how that impacted you? So my parents split, uh, when I was 11. So we were living in that duplex at that time. And so that was like basically like a house. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was nice. Um, but then when we couldn't afford to pay the rent, it was like, I had to move in with my grandparents, which is where I started lifting with my grandpa. And then the only thing I was like a little nervous about is when we, we needed to get out of there cause we need our own space. Yeah. But the only place we could afford was like a mile from their house, which was the trailer. And so I remember coming into the trailer and I'm like, it was way of a downgrade from where my grandparents live. Cause my grandpa had like a decent business and mm -hmm. they had nice stuff. And then like to the duplex, it was definitely, so I'm thinking like, but my mom kept saying, we're going to make it as nice as we can. We need our own space. You want your own room again. Like we need, we need space, mm -hmm. um, which it wasn't a big space. I mean, my, my trailer bedroom basically is the same size as my walk-in closet at my house. They're like an RV room. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> yeah. Basically yeah. That's, it's yeah. like a, like a, a room, like on a cruise ship or something. That's basically <laughs> yeah. what it felt like. It, like yeah. there was only a room. There's probably like two feet on the other side of my bed. That's yeah. it to walk okay. in. So, but at the end of the day, it was, you know, we were getting a chance to like get somewhere. So when I would, I remember when I would like walked up to it and I hate sound saying this because it makes me feel bad, but like, I was so embarrassed that that's where we were at, but I wasn't embarrassed that that's what my mom could provide. Mm -hmm. So it's like a weird thing, right? I, I always tell her and I part, talk about that in the book. Yep. It's not anything negative to her because she was just trying her best. She was just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. When you're trying to survive, you're not really worried about your stock portfolio. You're not worried about like, it, it just, it's a different mindset. You know what I mean? So it's like survival, you're just trying to get by. So I remember thinking like, this is all we can do right now. And that's cool. Um, but I, but I still was embarrassed. I'm, I'm a kid and I was still like, ah, 
Like, yeah, and you if know. you talk to G's bot for two seconds, like you can tell oh. she's a workhorse. Yeah. Oh, so like, yeah, dude. Yeah. She's that's why I never yeah. want her to get like embarrassed by that because yeah. I'm like, look, there's no me right now if that does that stuff doesn't happen. And if yeah. I don't feel that way, if I don't feel that way, I'm not gonna have this crazy drive. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just saw something on Instagram the other day. It said, um, you know, hard times make strong men. Yeah. Strong times make like basically like average men, and then average men make weak weak men. I mean, it's like, yeah. basically it's like a pattern, right? And so you go through a lot of hardship. You're going to be a fucking beast out of it. Yeah, you took and it and used it. I took it and used it. And so, but that was definitely like one of those things where I didn't have a place for like my weights. I didn't have a basement. I didn't have like, it just, it was, you know, I don't know. It's just one of those things where mm -hmm. I was embarrassed at the gate and I just wanted it to be different, but it's part of what I think pushed me. So. Yeah, of course. Uh, the other thing I'll, I'll say cold to like give you the, idea of the trailer so the trailer's from the 70s so it's like already kind of rough in the front the front room like i couldn't even believe this i remember walking in one day and literally it had snowed and so there's all the snow on the roof and literally like i said it, the whole roof is sagged down so much they can touch me on the head <laughs> and and my mom was like i had this big ass broom and i get on this ladder and literally push the snow off the top of it and we did that and it, it lasted for a while but then it started dripping and i'm like this motherfucker's gonna cave in like, and if this caves in, I don't even know where the fuck we're going to go. You know what I mean? Cause this was like the one that she could afford and it was close to my grandparents and whatnot. And in the school district, I want to stay in. And so my uncle Mike, who, you know, we've been off and on relationship wise, but at that time he came and helped and he built literally, there was two posts on each side and just two posts that ran across the ceiling that just was a brace to hold it up. So talk about you're already fucking not yeah. feel in your crib. Yeah. <laughs> then you bring your girl home in high school and she's like, what's with the pole in the middle of the yeah. fucking front room? <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I'm just, most of them didn't say that, but it's just a reality of like, it didn't, it, it looked like it was like untreated lumber. Yeah. A four by four, just post one on each side of the front room, which is, you know, probably as big as this That's set. Yeah. And so yeah. it just, it just stuck out. So you're like, fuck. So I'm thinking to myself, like, can I get a fucking win? <laughs> <You know? laughs> can i get a fucking win out here yeah. So, your game yeah, yeah. jeez <laughs> yeah go ahead i mean i mean that's like super important because at you you knew exactly what you never wanted to have happen Facts. again which is yeah. you know obviously played a huge inspiration to everything moving forward that's why i'm so like appreciative literally every day when i come home from the gym i can't believe like what my situation is i mean i believe it because i forced it to happen but mm -hmm. it's like you can't, if you can stay dialed in to what these feel, that's why this is such a good exercise and it's hard, but it's good because if you can keep that in the forefront, it keeps it everything in like check. I think for the most part, yeah, there's times in my life where it's been up, down, sideways and I forget some for of this sure. stuff, but like when you hear it back, it, mm -hmm. it makes it super real yeah. and I'm glad I went And then, it. you know. We talk about finding inspiration with, you know, the Dorseys and everything like yeah. that. Obviously, you know, you're, and you know, Dorsey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you're so you're seeing in your trailer, you have just the wooden post, but then you go down the street and then you see these guys. Yeah. Can you talk about obviously that probably had to even fuel the fire because you see what it, what it already can be. Oh, yeah. You know, so. Well, and, I, and I thought to myself, like, all right, what decisions are these people making? Because I knew they didn't come from money because he's a coal miner. He worked with my dad. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so did his, so did his uncle, Dor Josh's uncle, Kenny. And he owned, you know, and I, I remember hearing this story. So now I'm probably like 12 or 13. And I remember Kenny was the one that owned the duplex that basically had to tell us to leave. Who's the, the guy that owns the stores, Josh's uncle. Like it's all the same family. So I'm seeing the guy who used to own the duplex I lived in that I couldn't afford. He owns the grocery store and be early. It's like a quick mart, but he owns it like right there. And then I'm seeing his, his brother basically balling down the street and i'm like what are what decisions are these guys making that my family's not making like what what is the difference here and then i couldn't help but be jealous i've told this to josh before like of course i was jealous like he had always had the new kicks and the four wheelers and all this stuff but i was really more paying attention to how they were operating and yeah i was always down there hooping and and doing stuff and just it made me just realize like what was possible now if they weren't from the mines i might not have thought that that helped me a ton because everyone in my family worked in a coal mine. So I knew they was no different. Mm -hmm. So there was mm -hmm. nothing like, oh, they went to college and it wasn't that yeah. way. Kenny and Cliff were fucking miners that, that went and took risk. And so that helped me a ton. And I, I matched that up pretty early. But yeah, I, I, had, I would run between 
being jealous and being inspired. I mean, and that was tough for me as a kid to kind of process, but I was definitely more inspired than jealous for sure. Yeah, it's interesting that you were exposed to a whole new way of operating. Yeah. And then you internalized it. Did yeah. you ever have any conversation? I know you said you like they weren't aware of like no. your curiosity with them or whatever, but like did you ever have any conversations in, in that moment or like po- like later down the line? Yeah, I did at the Arnold 2 years ago. 3 years. So, well, the Arnold hasn't been around for like 2 years, but Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh Dorsey had a booth at the Arnold um when Max Effort was there and his parents came to see it. And so they came over to the Max Effort booth to see it um, before like everybody came in. And I, and I mentioned it to him then. They were completely unaware. <laughs> and he was like, you know, because they're just living their life. It's just mm-hmm. like, so, but what I am aware of because of that is how maybe some of the people in my house are looking at me and how they are when they come here to the office. And so I'm very aware of that because I was that kid. And I've seen it between different friends and things. Sure. It, I, I can notice the right questions that are being asked and you know, and so it's one of those things where they were unaware, but I'm definitely aware. So I'll do things intentionally because I can see it in people that are around me that are, that are like, okay, like yeah, I'm yeah. seeing something different here. And, um, when I told them that they took a lot of pride in it though, I could tell like they were like kind of shocked because once again, blue collar people just trying to, to change it, change their situation. And they changed, they did it, every one of their family members is different. Yeah. Even all the way down to my buddy Todd, his mom is their sister. He, my best friend growing up, he now is the third generation of the store owner. Like it, like how cool is that? Yeah, amazing. Like the me? entire family is yeah. completely different. There's four or five brothers and sisters. They all own businesses, but all started from the one guy that got out of the coal mine and started it. And then, so which is yeah. so powerful. And so I also I think locked onto the narrative. Well, look what Kenny did, and what Cliff did. Look how Josh understands money. And even in Josh's, you know, blazed his own path in an amazing way, but that's what he saw growing up too. Mm-hmm. And I asked him that before, Josh, what do you think it was easier for you to be an entrepreneur because that was your normal growing up? And he, absolutely. Cause you think it's possible. And that's really what I try to lock on with, um, with my kids, you mm-hmm. know, and with you guys. Yeah. I mean, obviously. So what do you think, Trey? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Trey's dialed in though. I like I'm, it. Yeah, I'm dialed in. Yeah, it's a lot. To, it's a lot to take in. Um, yeah, it's just like I just think it's super intriguing, like how it's like one of those things though that like you picked up on because I feel like that's like it's very similar like to myself. That's like how I was growing up too. Like you mean like you're hanging out with certain people and like you just know that you know they they got it they got it better they got it better than you. But yeah. then it makes you curious on like okay so but like, why. Yeah, but why? And there's so much, there's just, it just reveals layers to life and kind of lets you know that there's so much more out there than like, not even in just like your small town, like where you grew up at, but there's just so much out there that people can experience and just how they can live in just a lifestyle way. I think one of the things that really, because there was no like outline time of work, like I knew they were working at most of the, the same time as everyone else, but I would see like on a Tuesday, if we was off school in the summer, like maybe Cliff wasn't leaving at six or maybe he was, or maybe he was home early. Like I just remember yeah. like the, the, the non clock in clock out, but then I didn't realize like you're all obviously always working. Right. I didn't yeah. understand yeah. that part, but I, I think seeing that they weren't missing games. They were That's, at yeah. everything like the freedom. I started to notice not just the money, but some of the freedom too. And that was really intriguing to me because I felt like my mom was like, chained to her job my dad Mm -hmm. was chained to their job like and that was one of the big you know things that i was upset about is even though me and my old man were shaky he could never come to my basketball games came to one one game a year because that's when he was off work that week i mean then that's that was frustrating Mm -hmm. but then i was thinking like that was all of these things just played such a huge role in how i wanted to you know change my life so i think we're like starting to get that picture of like how everything's leading to this one point like, oh. cause like, obviously you had, you know, you had the Dorsey's, you had your, your grandpa, like, you know, you're internalizing all this stuff from like the value of hard work. You're, you're seeing the cut, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, all, all that stuff. You see so, how it's starting to, <laughs> yeah. Well, you see like why you're such a fucking workhorse yeah. pretty much. You know what I mean? So that kind of leads us into like one of the next sections, you know? So, um, basically you were willing to do whatever, whatever yeah. it took, you know, the, the lump, the lumber, uh, and then lead into the coal mine. So. Why don't you talk about that transition? Yeah, but. so the lumber yard was perfect for me because I worked with guys that I I knew of or knew. Um, and my one of my family members was one of the bosses there, like a, a cousin of mine, uh, Kurt. Shout out Kurt. He helped me get the job there. 
but also they, meaning the Danoon family, was the definitely the richest uh, family at home. They probably employed 200 people. I think the business was like over 40 million. He always had the new Hummer range, but he is like 70, wow. so he's like an mm-hmm. older dude. Yeah, but he was my grandpa and him golf together sometimes. Like I knew he had like major pop. And so I got this, so even though I hated the job, I thought it sucked, I didn't really like what I was doing. I I was literally getting in a single file line and stacking lumber for 10 hours. So there's six guys. It's It's a warehouse that's about, try to paint a picture, seven garage doors long, and it's just a big conveyor belt. So they cut the lumber, it comes down, and then I could, you know, know whether what style it was, what, what, what pile it went on. Mm -hmm. You literally take it, put it on the pile and get back in line for fucking 10 hours. And then you get a smoke break, which I was burning some Newports at the time. I (laughs) (laughs) I was struggling out here, but anyway, so I, uh, (laughs) and there it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mickey's forties and fucking Newports. But anyway, so I went out there and I remember thinking like, okay, this fucking sucks. There's no way I could do this for a long period of time, but I was able to witness what was built and it wasn't at just, I want to say just, I knew what the Dorseys had done with their store. I'm seeing a guy that's shipping stuff all over the world. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a guy that has hundreds of employees right down the street. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think that was impactful too because I got to see a second level of business. He passed away before I was able to like really talk to him as an adult. Mm -hmm. Um, And I actually drove back to go to his, um, his funeral to tell his son how impactful he was to me because they didn't know. But I was like, yo, big, they called him Big Bill. Yo, Big Bill was a beast. Like, he was a man of few words, but the execution was crazy. And so I think seeing that level, once again, knowing it was possible was really cool. But understanding that a lot of those guys hated their job. So I really got to see that as grown, like grown men that are really don't like what they do. Some of them really liked it, but a lot of the guys I worked with didn't. Um, But that transitioning into the coal mine was such an impactful time for me because it was double the wage. And yeah, it was scary, but I wanted a chance back to the workhorse part to experience what Joseph Boone, Frank Boone, Dave Gregory, Randy Thompson, I got uncles and just what they had. Mm-hmm. And I knew that time frame mm-hmm. was closing in. Mines are closing at home. Like, but even if I'd have got to do it for a day, it's I like would have this unique opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I, I knew, and I just knew that I can make the most money doing that. At the end of the day, yeah. that's, I had a defined time frame, the amount of money I needed, and that's all I cared about. I fucking worked, and I went to Dorsey's to lift whenever I was out of the mine, and it was halfway light out. That's it. <clears throat> that was all I cared about. Game plan. Yeah. That was yeah. my game plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, because I'm from the Valley too, so I get the whole coal mine situation where I have a lot of you know friends who are extremely hardworking, blue-collar dudes but they never see the opportunity like you did to go work hard, take this cash, save it up, and then go do a new opportunity to try and make something bigger happen. That's really hard to do, and I'll tell you why. It can catch you up real quick. Here's the other thing is, I was pretty good at it. I mean, I think it's because I'm bred Mm -hmm. to do it, basically, right? And so, and and I like physical labor, I'm you know, I'm strong, um, and I was super focused because I was trying to get the fuck out. But there was a time where, you know, I'm making like 1,500 a week, I never really had mm-hmm. any money. Um, it, it was start. I was starting to settle in a little bit because I was thinking, and I remember thinking to myself, like, you got to remember, this is 1998. This is no internet. I don't know a personal trainer. Like, I don't physically have never met ever in my life the job that I would like to do. I want to. I want to paint a picture. Like, it doesn't exist in person to me ever. It's a fictitious thing on 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 the TV that I think exists in California. Like, that's the way, like, you know what I mean? I didn't even know that if it was in Columbus in the big city. Like, I didn't even know if it was a thing. I knew that I could go to school for it. So when I'm working and doing all this, I started to think, like, shit, I could probably make, like, 80 grand a year doing this. I'm, I'm willing to do all this work. And I seen Randy, you know, I definitely had a better life for my mom and for himself when they got, you know, remarried once I graduated high school. And so I started to think, like, I'm good at this. I could do this. But uh, Randy was not having that. And I never really said that to him, but I think he could see me starting to like, the guys were starting to like me and they knew I was a little bit different, but they they definitely respected my work ethic. And, you know, he could see me settling in and he would tell me like, you know, you're not staying here. Right. You know that, right? Like that was actually going to be part of my next question. Yeah, please. Was, was like, 
you know, you, you get into a groove, you get into a routine, whatever, like you settle in, like it's really easy to get into that spot and stay there. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like no matter how shitty the job may be. Yeah. Um, was anybody trying to keep you there? Cause I know Randy was not trying to keep you. Randy there. was not trying to keep me there. Um, I think there was guys that probably thought I would stay. You feel a pull at all? Yeah, yeah. There's guys that I worked with then that are bosses now because we're in our forties, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Guys that were fucking beasts that their dads have been in the mine too. And I'm not surprised. And they've been super successful. They're fucking bread coal miners and yeah. they're proud of it. Right. Not, I'm proud to be a miner even for that short period of time. Um, it's so wild how that could have happened just as fast, just as easy. Mm-hmm. Um, Dude, but no, I real. think, yeah, I think that my vision, which was partially understood and not understood was so different than what those guys had heard that, um, they respected that I was trying to go do something different. But yeah, I would say if you probably went, you know, and bet on the money, they probably thought I'd be back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah. I think, um, the first time I, I got underground, um, they take you in for an orientation to see if you're like too scared to do it basically. Stones. Yeah. And so I rode underground and it was fucking scary. I'm riding on like, uh, you know, you, you get on the elevator and it goes 600 feet underground. So at first you're like, all right, where's the mine at? Well, you, it's just like a wash house where everybody, you know, the, the showers and the lockers for all the guys mm-hmm. gear and shit. You walk in, you go down on the cage and it happened. It doesn't go super fast, but it goes fast enough. And you're like, when you open it up, like when the, the elevator opens up, it's what's called an airlock. When airlocks all concrete. So basically they're locking the airflow of the mine from the, from the cage. So you open it up and it, kind of looks like all right not too bad and then you open the next door whole fucking place looks like it's gonna fall in and you can't stand up and i'm thinking i'm trying to fuck am i gonna do here (laughs) yeah dude and you know and it's like one of those things like all right and then once they put you on the belt line it's so fucking loud and like you don't you see one other guy for literally 10 12 15 hours you're just shoveling on your knees while you're your back's rubbing the ceiling and you're just like is this fucking worth 14 bucks but i just kept thinking to myself like I got to get to overtime. I got to get to overtime. And Randy taught me this. Get to overtime as fast as possible. Because, dude, it's way easier to fucking do that shit for 20 bucks an hour <laughs> than it is for 14. Mm-hmm. So I would get to overtime within like three days. Yeah. Wow. Easy. Two and a half, three days. I'd be at overtime. And then I'm getting 50 hours of overtime on one pay. Get the fuck out of here. Damn. You know what I mean? And so, But that's when you start to get pulled in thinking. Yeah. I could have a way better life right now. No matter yeah. what. Yeah. But but I definitely think the biggest takeaway is I have mad respect for all my friends who are coal oh, miners yeah. because there's some of the most hardworking blue dude. collar dude. And that mind dude, I hear most them talk coal about miners that. like coal mining. That's, That's what, what people yeah. don't realize. Which, which there was a <laughs> lot of kids who I went to school with who were like, I'm just going to coal mine because honestly they didn't want to go to school. They're yeah. like, I can do this, make a living, support my family, do yes. all that stuff. So, you know, like mad respect, but it's that mindset of blue collar willing to do whatever it takes to make it happen. And in yeah. this case, you just knew that there was a next opportunity. I waiting. just remember thinking to myself, Cole, I, there's my buddy, uh, his name was Zach. He worked uh, a lot of times on the same shift as me. He went to Akron. And so like he, they called us like college help. I hadn't left yet, but a lot of these mm-hmm. guys had been there before. We're shoveling. He's on one side of the belt. I'm on the other side. And I'm like, and it's fucking suck. Terrible. It, like it's muddy at the bottom. It's muddy at the top. I'm like, yo. I just don't know if this shit is worth it, bro. And he's like, oh, it's worth it. He's like, you're trying to get the fuck out of here, ain't you? I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm trying to get the fuck out of here. Like, you know, but you have to just remind yourself that it is short term, all fucking gas. All, and I can't tell you when my mind shifted that I need all of it. I need every fucking dollar that I can extract from this coal mine. And I'm going to give them my work for it. But I need it all. It's going to take all of it to get me out of here because I was going to have to pay for everything. And so when I really like made my mind up to embrace it, I was like, I knew that no one was going to have this story. I knew that. Tunnel vision, bro. Yeah, literally in a tunnel. Literally. (laughs) (laughs) Literally tunnel vision in a tunnel. So what else you got, Cole? It's go time, right? Yeah, man. Go time. So now you get the money. Can you talk about, you know, now you're venturing into the unknown. You got 20 grand saved up. Yeah. Walk us through what's happening. Yeah, man. I was trying to get to the club, bro. Push the I was trying to get to the club. Of course. Of <laughs> yeah. course. I'm like, all right. I've been, uh, you know, Still listening to Tupac so much. I'm about to go to the city. Let's get out of here. You know, <laughs> what was amazing was Dustin and those guys had was at Cincinnati and they transferred to Ohio State. 
and I came up here, met Don Laventhal, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Shut Imagine, up. isn't it amazing that Don's in our life right now? And I met him at this point in my life. Absolutely. Which yeah. is crazy. Yeah. So I come in there and I realize that I'm not a four year college guy. That's a fact. I already knew that about myself. I needed a one or two year situation. And um, finding out that Columbus State had basically a one year personal training certification. And here's where more, a lot more confidence was built for me. I had earned that money, bro. No one gave that shit to me. That's a fucking fact, right? And when I was able to come up and pay for school every semester or quarters, whatever the fuck they were on, I was able to pay for it. I was able to pay for my house, which on campus is a shit show. You're renting yeah, a room yeah, for four hundred dollars a month, so it's like five, six grand. I wrote a check for the whole year, boom, paid for all that, bought myself a little Acura Integra so I can move around a little bit more. That the door handles worked, which was awesome. And I I felt like I really am like a grown ass like kid now. Like I I did this for myself. And so that right there, that was a big win, man. Mm -hmm. One, you know, it's anybody that grows up in a small town, it's a big mm -hmm. win to, to get away, right? To get away without no help, to be able to like execute some like big boy stuff on my own, and then to be doing something I like. I'm learning. I had never been in a school situation, even though I was not really paying attention as much as I should, but I was not in a school situation where I was actually ever learning something I wanted to learn. I hated school. I was a 2.0 student because of that. So when I, Dawn's actually teaching advanced weight training, I've paid for it. I want to be there. You know what I mean? So it's like, um, I think that that situation helped the initial, all of these things that were confident. Just being able to be a coal miner makes you more confident. It's fucking hard to be able to do that, getting those paychecks and, and accumulating that money. You got to remember, man, like my mom was remarried, so they had it better. Having thousands of dollars at one time, I don't know that my mom to that point of her life had ever had that. Yeah. And I got 20000 in the bank. Like that <laughs> yeah. felt like I was stroking checks. Fucking <laughs> rich. I wasn't, but I mean, but they felt that way. But I knew that I needed that level of security to leave and go give it a chance mm -hmm. so yeah Thanks. fucking well, awesome was we good banger. for chapter one yeah, that was a banger well, for a chapter it's real too. man all right on the chapter two <laughs>